You know, there's this concept of overclocking being dead that I sort of want to talk about. Um, it's partially true, but we're, we're, we're going to talk about modern CPU components, even GPU components, and whether or not like overclockability is something you should even care about anymore. For those looking for a high-end custom gaming experience, look no further than Falcon Northwest. Falcon Northwest has been building PCs made for gamers for over 30 years with a focus on a true high-end gaming experience. Custom cases available only through Falcon Northwest feature state-of-the-art testing and design to ensure that every component is performing at their best through thermal imaging and rigorous lab testing designed and overseen by the Falcon Northwest founder himself. With a complete lineup of systems ranging from small to large, every Falcon Northwest system includes a three-year warranty policy and a year of two-way overnight shipping coverage providing the ultimate peace of mind. To see all that Falcon Northwest has to offer, follow the sponsored link in the description below. So all overclocking means is pushing an ASIC beyond its like rated speeds. So an ASIC could be anything. It could be a CPU, it could be a GPU, it could be a Raspberry Pi, right? It could literally be anything. Anything that has a core clock. Um, so our CPUs, as you know, have all sorts of varying clock speeds these days. And there's like single core, there's two core, there's like three core, six core, eight core. And what I mean by that is that's the amount of cores under load that determine the speed. So that's why every single CPU that you look at now says up to 5.5 gigahertz or up to 5.8 gigahertz, because there's a very strict set of criteria that has to be met to be able to get that clock speed. Is there a thermal headroom? Are you anywhere near your, your TJ Maxx on temperature? Uh, what is your power limit? What is your power draw? It's like power draw would be things like how many amps is it actually drawing through the CPU? How, many, how much voltage is being sent to the GPU? How hot's the GPU? So all these things play into a, a factor when it comes to your clock speeds. Now the thing is, with modern, modern components being pushed as far as they're being pushed today, like. Five gigahertz was a pipe dream five years ago. Like five years ago, sure, you might have you might have had a 9900K here and there that could hit like five gigahertz, maybe all core, maybe. And then really good chips might be able to do like five one single or dual core load. Now we're talking like 58 or 14900Ks doing like 5800 megahertz single core and two core load and then up to 5.5 gigahertz all core. That's like completely unheard of. But one of the ways that they've achieved that is the fact that they have to push the power limits kind of to in insane envelopes. So for instance, the 14900K, which I have installed on my test bench right here on an Asus uh, board. I don't remember which one it is exactly. I really don't remember which one it is. It says up to 5.5 gigahertz, but it run, it's at 253 watts. Now what I'm gonna show you here real quickly, real quick, and we'll kind of do some demonstrations here of, of how to get the full advertised performance out of your CPU because essentially it's almost like an overclock now to get the advertised speeds, which is really stupid and should border on marketing legality at this point. Um, you can see right here, we have a couple cores that are sitting in the 5.8 gigahertz range. There's one right there, there's one right there. It's gonna hand off to down there, watch. See, that went five, five back. And so core two and three in the P core arrangement tend to be the preferred cores for the higher clock speeds. All the E cores, as you can see, are at 4.3. Now, realistically, what should happen here is when I start Cinebench, we should see it go to 5.5 gigahertz all core. The problem is what we're gonna find is that getting 5.5 gigahertz all core at a full 100% sustained load is not what you're gonna get. You're gonna get like 5.251. So check this out. We don't care about our score and stuff right now on Cinebench. I'm just using this as a benchmark to load up the CPU. So right now we'll look at the scores to compare, but I don't, as I, as I hit start on all core, test or multi-core, you're gonna see 5.5 five on all cores, no, 5.2. It dropped, like we got like three or four seconds of 5.5 gigahertz. And what sucks about that is that's all that was basically required for Intel's up to 5.5 gigahertz to really be legal. So our power shoots right up to 253.xx watts. And that's exactly what its max power rating is. Now that's why we're not actually able to get 5.5 five on all cores sustained is because there has to be a limiting factor. There's, there is a throttle reason, yes. Right now, if I was to bring up XTU or Extreme Tuning Utility uh, from Intel, it would have a throttle reason of yes as power. Power would be our limiting factor here. So what a lot of motherboard manufacturers are doing is they're lifting up those power limits out of the box. And I've already done a complete rant video explaining that it, motherboard manufacturers need to leave Intel limits in place unless the user goes in and specifies lift those limits because the cooler has everything to do with how well it can perform. Because the problem is when you lift the power, what do you do? You also lift the temperatures. What's essentially become overclocking these days is not pushing the core necessarily beyond 
It's rated specific or it's specified speeds, which is the up to 5.8 single core and up to 5.5 gigahertz all core on a 49 or 14900K. It's just trying to manipulate the specs to get the advertised speeds sustained. So let's do this. I'm gonna go ahead and load up XTU. I love XTU because it allows me to make these changes on the fly in the OS. So right now what I wanna see is can I even come close to getting beyond 5.5 gigahertz all core? And I'm not entirely so sure because components are pushed so close to the limit these days with that you know, well over, well into the five gigahertz range. Even the AMD, and that's an AMD rig behind me with a, I don't remember which CPU is on there, but it's an AMD system right there. Even with AMD's precision boost overdrive and stuff, it's very difficult to get the advertised speeds for very long. And even those CPUs are up into the five gigahertz plus range now, which is huge for AMD. They were lacking in the clock speeds for so long and they've definitely caught up into that five gigahertz race. So here's our, our performance core ratio multiplier 55. So it's that times 100, that's how we get the 5500. And then the efficiency core at 4.3. Now what I'm gonna do right now is I actually have to go into, you know what? I'm gonna click automatic overclock and see what happens. I haven't done this in a while. Let's just see if it actually does anything useful. Okay, so it lifted it 100 megahertz on each and lifted the offset by 20 millivolts. Well, the temp went to 90C immediately. There's 5.5 five all core. Now we drop 5.4. Hey, it's actually doing something. Look at our TDP right there, 330 watts, 93C on the core, and we are getting the 5.5 gigahertz all core. But you notice we have 5.6 selected, and we're not getting 5.6, we're actually at 5.4 right now. And that's because of the fact that it probably upped our power limit to that 330 mark, which means that with our voltage being extremely high right now at 1.330, we're not even getting the number we put in. We're still not even getting sustained advertised numbers. And we've added clock speed and we've added voltage. So the power and current limits optimized gave us a limit of 330, which is what I thought just based on what I saw right there, 425 amps. And then, you know, so now we can actually adjust this sort of stuff. But I'm gonna go five, six, I'm gonna try five, seven all core at stock voltages. Let the 330 be the thing. I'm not gonna update the voltage. Yeah, so you're immediately down to 5.5 gigahertz. We're at 323 watts, 91C. Now this is where ASIC quality really starts to play a role where if we have a really good CPU that will allow us to undervolt and overclock, then we'll get really good performance here. And I think 330 watt is a safe limit to have because of the fact that we know the 360 cooler can handle that. Anything more than that would require some exotic cooling probably, something chilled or, or beyond room temp. There's a 38,835, but this is still underperforming so much versus what I would expect. I've gotten or 13900Ks to be nearly 40,000 and above 40,000. This so far would start to be a lot of tuning and a lot of work for 300 megahertz. Now, what's more important than quote unquote overclocking these days is just getting our advertised speeds for sustained periods of time. So here's what we're gonna do again. We're gonna drop this back down to 5.5. We're gonna leave the efficiency core at uh, 43, which is stock. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I wanna leave the enhanced limits because we know we need more power limit to get it done. But I'm gonna start playing with the offset here. I'm gonna go minus 50 millivolts. And let's see if this will allow us to get, all I'm trying to do now, screw overclocking. I'm just trying to get that all core number to stay all the time. Now the thing is while gaming and stuff right now with a lesser load, it would probably stay at 5.5 just fine. But open, overclocks are not considered stable unless they can handle extreme workloads like this without crashing. Like there's game stable, there's like general usage stable, and then there's like stress test stable. And stress test stable is the only one that we really truly care about. Okay, there's 5.5 five all core. 84C, still at 5.5. Five. 84, 83, so that looks like we have a pretty good comparison there where temperature is not gonna cause us to drop. 5.5 five the entire time. And there's a 38,329. So you see, all I did was I didn't overclock anything. I just dropped how much voltage it needed. Um, yeah, we're only pulling 288 watts right now, which is nice at 5.5 gigahertz. But as you can see, the stock speeds couldn't sustain that with the stock 253 watt because the up to and the 253 watt limit were never gonna allow full load to sustain those types of clocks. But I do wanna see now if we can do a 5.6 all core overclock at a minus 50. Now we're overclocking technically because we are above the 5.5 recommended, not recommended, but stated max up to speeds. 
We stayed at 5.6 the whole time. There's a 38,729, so not a huge gain. But voltage and frequency are linked. So as frequency goes up, voltage goes up with it. So now I'm gonna try minus 60. So now we dropped to 307, 309, we're at 89C. So this is also a spike right here. This is the max temps. That means it hit 91 for a second. We're at 88, 89 now. So we drop 3C, 2C, 3C, but there also will become a point where you'll see the clock sustain. But if you drop the voltage too far, you'll notice the score drops, even though the frequency stays the same. And the reason for that is because of the lower uh, available wattage to it and that wattage um, voltage linear frequency scale, you might, there might be uh, frequency changes happening too quickly to actually see in the software, but the frequency might be doing quick micro adjustments. That's enough to actually affect the score. So once you start to see the score go down, if, you can, if you're like, I can keep undervolting, this is great. You might notice performance going down with it and stability still being there. I'm gonna drop down to minus 80 and see if we can sustain that. If so, then I might push the efficiency cores up to four six. Now we're technically in overclocking territory. Oh, so we actually drop score right there. It's a 39,634. So I'm gonna run this again, just to see if we continued, like we lost 200 points by dropping our voltage. I wanna make sure that we're not getting like micro throttling with the frequency here. That could have just been a weird back-to-back -back run on that one. Yeah, we lost more points, 39,577. So I'm gonna go minus 75 and see if that five millivolts helps. You'd be surprised what five millivolts can actually do. It's a 39,779, okay. So let's try 4.6 e core. Oh, there's a hard system lock. So this video right now was not about showing you how to overclock. It is showing you how much work is actually kind of involved to get a very mediocre overclock. Overclocking, the way we know it and used to know it, is very, very different than 10 years ago. My best overclocking CPU I ever owned was a E6300 Core 2 Duo, 1.86 gigahertz processor that I ran at 3.34 gigahertz for its entire life. Almost double the rated speed. It was two cores and no hyperthreading. That actually was hyperthreading? I don't remember. I cannot remember if it was hyperthreaded or not. But all I know is the frequency it ran at was insane. I ran that CPU for years and then gave it to my brother-in-law where he ran it until he killed the motherboard, completely unrelated to the CPU. That CPU never complained about temperatures or frequency. That was some, one of the most underrated CPUs ever. But back in the day, you know, we would be able to push our, our frequency, we would see CPU frequency pushed a thousand megahertz above its posted speeds. But because the hardware is being pushed to its limits now, because of the CPU race that took place ever since Ryzen came out with AMD, giving actual danger to Intel's market share when it comes to desktop computing, we saw this race for speed, for clock speed. So essentially, the manufacturers like Intel and AMD have found ways to push their CPUs to the limit, as close to the limit as they possibly can out of the box, like how there's updates underway, push the limits as far as they can out of the box, leaving us very little headroom to be able to actually kind of overclock. Now GPUs, let's talk about GPUs for a second here. I don't even really need to demonstrate this one. Every single GPU you plop on your computer or new motherboard and fire up like MSI Afterburner and monitor your speeds, every single one of them will go beyond where they're advertised. They will auto overclock and that's by design because it's called GPU boost for NVIDIA. Um, AMD has other uh, like auto overclocks and rage mode and stuff like that, which are not quite as aggressive because AMD is still kind of figuring out the, the, the silicon limits and stuff when it comes to their GPU, so they don't actually allow you, allow you to push them too, too far. There's a lot of modding required to really push an AMD GPU. But NVIDIA, on the other hand, when it comes to GPU boost, we're in GPU boost three plus territory now, where back in the day, it used to push the frequency if there was available temperature headroom. Then they, GPU boost would allow it to push the frequency with temperature headroom and power limit headroom, where it could go beyond its specified power limits. See, back in the earlier days of GPU Boost uh, 1.0, you could actually modify the voltage slider. You could actually move the voltage slider and have it affect actual voltage to the GPU, giving you proper, like real overclock, uh, overclock ability when it comes to the end user. Once GPU Boost 2.0 allowed for power limit adjustment, the control of the voltage stopped 
being accessible to the end user, where all you could do is control the voltage slider. And what I mean by that is, like I referenced with the CPU, how there's a frequency and a voltage uh, correlation, like correlation between the two. If you move up the frequency, the voltage moves with it. All you can do with NVIDIA now, when it comes to the voltage slider, is move where that slider is. And what I mean is you can up the voltage at a sooner frequency, but you can't exceed the voltage that is by design. That voltage is locked down, you, you can't exceed it, unless you go and do voltage mods and shunt mods and custom voltage controller soldering and all that sort of stuff. Now we're talking XOC or extreme overclocking. So overclocking on the GPU hasn't even been fun because of the fact that you just, we're already in the 2700, 2800 megahertz range and you might overclock at 300 megahertz, we're talking just over 10%, which would be very difficult to actually notice in games an additional 10% of frames on a high-end GPU. And most people spend their time overclocking the high-end GPUs because there's nowhere above that to go tier-wise, so you have to overclock it. So overclocking as we know it in the past is kind of dead. I mean, now all we're trying to do is just tame these monster, monsters that are asking for enormous amounts of power and TDP to be cooled, which is now making things like water cooling relevant again. So that's why I think this year I'm going to bring water cooling month back in the summertime where we just do all kinds of water cooling projects and videos and stuff and playing around with it because of the fact that the high-end CPUs and the high-end GPUs are definitely demanding. I mean, we're talking 600 watt GPUs, we're talking over 300 watt CPUs from Intel with ASUS like multi-core enhancement and MSI's whatever they call it, trickery. Like all of the motherboards are pushing the CPUs beyond their 253 watt for 1490 or 1400K. And I think it's like 270 watt or 230 watt or 220 watt for, I can't remember. Anyway, every CPU has its own maximum wattage. Every motherboard is pushing those beyond because they're trying to push the frequencies as far as they can out of the box. So it's nice that the overclocking is kind of being done for you, but if you like the fun of tinkering and overclocking like me, they sort of took all that away. That's kind of depressing. How do you guys feel about it? Anytime I've done overclocking videos in the past, I see a plethora of comments saying, overclocking is stupid. Why would you overclock? Why not? Why did anyone decide at one point, let's take two cars and see if you can go faster that way? 